All right, everybody, welcome to session 4.3. This is the last of our sessions about the job search. We're going to talk a little bit about networking and social events. Uh, before we get into this, I do want to take a moment to emphasize that you need to make sure you do the reading from the book on this. Uh, Bill Baker does a great job of describing some important advice about networking, about how to behave at things like cocktail parties. He gives you some guidelines about etiquette. I can't stress how important those basic things are. If you don't know, for example, that you should always wait to eat until everybody at your table has been served, then you need to go back and read all those pieces of advice um, about proper table manners and so on. It's uh, You might think it's unfortunate, but it's just the way it is. Uh, small errors like that can really leave the wrong impression with people. So uh, what I'm going to talk about today are th these three things. First, tips on socializing. Um, some of you, I think, may have anxiety about how to behave at uh, like a cocktail party or something like that. We'll discuss that. Um, many of you probably have concerns about the fact that you're LDS and you're going to be out in a world where most people you encounter are not LDS. And then finally, we're going to talk about networks generally and why they exist and how to be a good member of a network. Let's talk about socializing. <clears throat> There's this idea that people who are good at socializing are interesting people. Uh, these are people who can have a comfortable conversation with just about anybody. They always have scintillating observations to add to the conversation. They have great experiences to share. They've had interesting lives. They're usually extroverted instead of introverted. All of this is not true. Um, the reality is that the best way to socialize and the people who are best at socializing are not interesting people, but they are interested in people. And this is kind of the key insight I want you to take away. If you ever have felt anxiety at a banquet you've had to go to or at a cocktail party or even just a party with friends where you don't know everybody there, that anxiety is totally normal. In fact, everybody feels that. But the trick is not feeling like you somehow have to be an interesting person. The trick is to just be interested in people. And if you're interested in other people, the reality is that makes you an interesting person. There's one thing that everybody absolutely loves in their encounter with somebody else, and that's when the other person asks them questions about themselves. So the trick for you in any social event is to ask questions. Just take the time to, to, to learn about a person um, you know, get to know them, uh, continue asking questions. Even if the conversation feels very one-sided, you'll, you'll find that people are very comfortable talking about themselves. And even if they never ask you a question about yourself, they'll walk away from the conversation saying, oh, what a nice person that was, even if they never got to know anything about you. So keep that in mind that asking questions is easily the best way to be comfortable and to have a good time at a social event. Make sure you avoid this problem. Probably the most common question in every social event, and it's especially prominent in places like Washington, D.C. or New York City, is this question, you know, so tell me what you do for a living. Um, it's a fine question, but the problem is that it has way too much weight and priority with people. Uh, be interested in who these people are, not just what they do for a living. Um, it also helps you avoid awkward moments where, if, for example, the person is unemployed at the time. You don't have to ask them about that. Um, ask questions that relate to who they are, not just what they do for a living. <clears throat> Let me give you three questions you can use. You can use these three questions. These are my three go-to questions anytime I'm in a social event. The first one I ask is, where are you from? I like asking this question because I feel like it gives me some interesting insight into the person. It gives me fodder for asking more questions. Another great question is, how did you end up at this organization, at this conference, at this event? Um, you know, if you're getting to know new coworkers, you'd ask about how do you end up working here? If you're getting to know people at a conference, you know, tell me what brings you to the conference. Um, if you're at a party, say, oh, well, what brings you to this party? Do you know so-and-so? And you can dig in that way. These are all, this is another great question that opens doors to more questions. And then finally, what do you like to do in your spare time? Uh, th this is a great way to get to know somebody outside of a work environment. Um, it's a question that pretty much everybody can answer. They can talk about their interests. And like I said, it gives fodder for more questions. And that really is key. 
um, you know, this, this cartoon, I love Doghouse Diaries, and this cartoon just came out today, actually. And in it, he, he illustrates that question, so where are you from? And uh, here he's got his big, long description about how, well, he was born in Boston, but he kind of lived all over the world and had these fascinating experiences. But it's too hard to explain all that in response to that question, so where are you from? So he just says, well, I'm from Boston. I think you might look at that and go, oh, that's totally how it is. I know exactly. Like People don't want a big, deep answer, but you should be digging for that answer. Everything that's in the thought bubble there, you should be digging into that. And, that, and that's why it's so important after you ask those initial questions to pick a detail and then ask more questions. And this is where it gets really easy. In fact, it's those, it's those first moments that are the awkward ones, those first moments where you say, hi, I'm so-and-so. If you can get that over that first one or two questions, what happens is the person starts offering detail and you just pick a detail and you move on. So if I was the person in that in that cartoon who asked where he's from, I'd say, oh, were you born in Boston? How long did you live there? And then that's when he would say, well, actually, when I was young, we moved to the Mariana Islands. And oh, my gosh, that would be so fascinating to meet somebody who lived in a place like that and start asking more questions. It really is the simplest way to have a great time at a social event because you learn all these fascinating things about people. So once you've asked your initial question, pick a detail and start asking more questions. And remember this advice I gave you last time in the last session about interviewing. People notice warmth first. So be warm. Be Show an interest in them, a sincere interest. Think about them and, and their well-being as you're asking questions. Put yourself in their shoes, empathize, uh, do all of those things, and you'll have a great experience. Okay, let's talk about the Mormon thing. Now, um, for those of you in class who are Mormon, you probably, based on my experience with students over the years, have anxiety about three things. <clears throat> the first is, what do you do about events with alcohol? Do you go to them? If you go to them, how do you behave? The second question is, what do you do if the discussion or conversation involves moral issues, especially if people are expressing opinions that are contrary to your moral beliefs? How do you engage in a conversation like that without offending people? And then finally, what do you do if the event takes away from family time? A lot of employment-related events happen after hours. And uh, that's precious family time. You know, that's when the kids are home from school. But, you know, uh, you know, when life gets busy, you've got maybe an hour at home between homework and dinner and all the other things that have to happen in the evening. You, you don't have much time to spend with your kids or your spouse. And uh, family time is precious. So what do you do if social events take you away from family time? I'm going to give you some brief insights on each of those questions. Talking first about the alcohol thing. This quote comes from an actual BYU recruiter. So this is from somebody who comes to BYU. And uh, the the uh, placement, uh, the career services office will occasionally interview uh, or do surveys of employers to know wh what sort of experience they're having with married school graduates. And this was a common element of feedback. This quote just exemplifies a general uh, um, problem that they've encountered is that BYU married school students, when they're in the work world, don't always build close bonds with coworkers because they don't engage in the same kind of social activities. It might be the case that your coworkers go to happy hour every once in a while. And happy hour obviously implies going to a bar where people will be drinking alcohol. And so what do you do? Uh, there might be a cocktail party, for example, or some other event that involves alcohol. And this is this this, this can be hard for some Latter-day Saints. I know some of you are listening to me right now and just rolling your eyes, thinking, oh my gosh, this is ridiculous. But for others of you, this is a new experience and you're, you don't feel comfortable as to how you should behave in a situation like that. Um, the Probably the most important point I can make, and as graduate students, most of you are familiar with are comfortable with this notion, but I want to emphasize that cocktail parties or other sort of social drinking in the adult world is nothing like teenage drinking parties. You know, if you grew up Mormon, um, you had a bishop tell you to stay away from drinking parties, and that was great advice. Because when teenagers drink, they drink to get drunk. Um, it's a really irresponsible level of drinking. But uh, that's not how people behave in professional settings, cocktail parties, or even going to happy hour. Sometimes they do it to get drunk, but not always. The point is, is that 
drinking at that level is not the same as a teenage drinking party. The most important difference being that nobody's going to care if you drink or not. If you're there and you're drinking a 7-Up, nobody's going to think any less of you. In fact, a lot of people, it won't even occur to them that you're not drinking alcohol. Or if it does, they might assume that you don't drink for health reasons or because you're driving later or any number of other reasons because there are a lot of reasons that people don't drink that have nothing to do with their religious beliefs. So you can go to these events and feel comfortable because you can drink. They always have non-alcoholic drinks. In fact, in a lot of bars and other places, you can actually get soda for free because they do that so they can encourage designated drivers. So the reality is you can have a great experience. Now, obviously, you don't want to be in a situation where everybody is getting plastered and where they're taking, you know, and where they might pressure you to drink alcohol, you know, keep yourself away from those situations, but also recognize that a lot of these moments are great opportunities to get to know people. And if the, if the presence of alcohol keeps you away, then it keeps you away from the people you should be getting to know better. All right, let's talk about moral issues. Here's a quote from a, from a, a BYU recruiter. BYU students have an inability to deal with and fit in with people who don't necessarily follow LDS church teachings regarding things like the word of wisdom, morality, and so on. This is obviously really problematic for, um, this is really problematic for a lot of students because of this. It's not because when you have a conversation or when it comes up, like, uh, you know, let's say a coworker comes to work on Monday and says, oh my gosh, I'm so excited. My girlfriend finally agreed to move in with me. How do you have a conversation like that if you're a member of the church? You certainly, you know, wouldn't encourage that kind of behavior uh, of, you know, living with a boyfriend or girlfriend. But the, for the, a lot of the rest of the world, it's really common and, and not much is thought of it. So how do you deal with a situation like that? The most important thing you can do in any moment like that is to affirm the friendship. Even if this is a budding friendship, if this is somebody you're just meeting now at the party and getting to know, the most important thing you do is just affirm that friendship and that relationship. Now, we'll talk, we'll practice some strategies about this in class, but uh, I want you to remember that concept or principle. Okay, let's move on now to the third one, which is family time. Um, BYU graduates tend not to socialize as much outside of the office as others. And again, that has to do with the fact that you don't want to be away from your family. Um, you need to remember this. People want to like their coworkers. They do. Everybody wants to like the people they work with, and you can't like somebody you don't know. So here's the thing. If you are married and you have a spouse at home, kids at home, um, then you need to prior you need to work out that expectation and sort it out. Because here's the problem. If you never if you're the one who goes to work and just put your you know, head down and, and sort of grinds through the day, gets all your work done, goes home, and you never spend much time socializing with your coworkers as a result because you want to make the most of your family time at home, the odds are your career is going to suffer. And it's not going to suffer because you do bad work. It's going to suffer because nobody knows you. And people don't like working with people they don't know. Um, th this makes it harder for you. So if your office has a tendency to go out after work on occasion, you should try to make time to do that. If your office has a tendency to do it a lot, then maybe you can't do it all the time, but try to do it some of the time. If that's just not possible, if, if your family situation is such, or your relationship with your spouse is such that that time is too precious to give away to spending time with your coworkers, then you need to make up for it somehow. And that's okay. If you don't want to go out in the evening with coworkers because you'd rather be home and you just never want to do that, then you have to compensate. You have to figure out a way to socialize and get to know your coworkers because people want to like their coworkers and they can't like people they don't know. Okay, so we'll talk more about those three issues in class. Um, I want to wrap up by talking about networks. This whole class session was supposed to be about networking. We haven't really talked about it. We've mostly just talked about socializing. But that's how networks are built, is through socializing. In fact, the term networking, I feel, kind of um, diminishes the importance of, of socializing. That, you know, the, the, the networks we build up, we build up with the people that we like. And you can't really get to like somebody unless you spend time socializing with them. 
So socializing really does come first and is the base of every network. Um, in fact, to kind of illustrate this, I love this cartoon. Here, Ed is asking people to help him move and borrow money, and he's turning to his Facebook friends, and none of them are helping. And, uh, you know, the reason for this is because those friendships aren't social. I mean, they call it a social network, but the reality is most of what goes on on Facebook doesn't doesn't create the kind of social connection necessary to build up a reliable network. You have to know and trust and like these people that are in your network. And if that's not the case, if you don't have shared experiences that make you inclined to help another person, then your network is kind of worthless. Good networks have three attributes. Um, they are best maintained by offering help to others. Um, service is is key. Um, the reason is because people don't want to be burdened. They like being aided in their social networks. And so if you want to build up your social network, you should be offering help. Now, it's hard to know what kind of help you can offer to people, especially if they're f far away. I mean, you don't get requests to move from, you know, mentors you had in your internship over the summer. But there are a lot of interesting ways you can help that are really important. For example, if you come across an interesting article, you can take the time to email that article to your mentor and say, hey, I read this article and thought of you. That's an example of how you can offer help. Um, you're offering something that doesn't require anything from them. Uh, networks should not be burdensome for their members. This is kind of the inverse of what I was just talking about. If you make too many requests on your network members, they will withdraw from your network. Um, you know, you can think of it as kind of like a bank account. You sort of build up by, by contributing to your network, and then you make withdrawals by asking for help. And if you're asking for help such that you're going into a deficit that you're not covering and providing enough value to everybody else, they won't you won't be a welcome part of the network anymore. And then finally, you need to make sure that when you interact with network members, you put time and thought into your interaction. Um, you know, there's nothing worse than a shallow interaction that's obviously intended for some sort of goal. If you have to ask somebody for help, for example, a referral or a recommendation for a job, make sure that you put time and thought into that interaction. Um, you know, make sure, take the time to remind them of why, the of why the network connection is important. You know, what it is you love about them and why you're grateful for their help. Be thoughtful in your expression. Make it sincere and uh, it preserves the, the network member and helps them know that they're still appreciated and liked by you and that they're not just a tool for you to accomplish your goal. So anyway, we'll talk more about networking in class. We'll actually practice and do some little practice activities together, but um, uh, we'll see you all next time.